think if I remember correctly, before, right after, I think this is where we left off. I know not yesterday because we jumped ahead, but at Christmas time, is this where we were at? Oh, we got all the way there. Hey, that makes me happy. So we talked about electronegativity and dipoles. Oh, oh, oh. All right. We may get a little bit farther from it. All right. Stop it. Let me be a little cool. So I really didn't want to go over all that again. All right, in ionic bonding, we really don't talk about it that much in this chapter, because from here we're going to go to molecular geometry and that wouldn't uh, apply to ionic bonding. All right, so we know ionic bonding is when the electrons are actually, keep on hitting this with my bracelet and changing it. When the electrons are actually transferred so that's going to be uh, when there's a really large electronegativity difference. And so um, this is what it ends up looking like as far as the sh uh, the, how the, they will um, organize themselves. Remember, this one is going to be the anion because it's gained electrons and it'll get larger. And this one would be the cation because it's always going to be the smaller one. And I know they're labeled there, you can see it right there, but even if you didn't have that, you should be able to be able to tell that um, if you're given some type of structure. So they're going to um, transfer their electrons once again, just for the same reason that bonds are formed to try to gain that noble gas structure and increase their stability and decrease their energy level. Um, and we know that they become charged, so we they are now called ions. Um, the metals tend to lose their electrons and form the positive cations, and then the nonmetals will do the opposite. And an ionic bond is usually formed between the metal and a nonmetal. That's all that we talked about in Chem 1, and we really, that's going to be the only thing we talk about in Chem 2, but there are some um, exceptions. Um, so you'll have your electrostatic forces are large. So this is considered a strong bond. And once again, you could use that Coulomb's law to kind of predict the strength of it. So if you remember Coulomb's law, it was something like Q1, Q2 divided by R2. So Q was a charge. So as you increase the difference in the charges between your positive and negative ion, it's going to become a stronger bond. I don't know what that is when it does that. Is that what you're hearing something? Yeah. yeah. I have no idea what that is. And if, as the ion becomes larger or the radius becomes larger, it would actually decrease that force. And then it has a little question there at the bottom that kind of applies to that. Which of the two ionic compounds would be expected to have the strongest bond. So all of them, this is plus one, this is minus one, and this is plus one, and this is minus one. So we can't worry about the difference in charges. That's not going to affect which one is going to have the stronger bond. So the next thing that I would have to look at would be size. And if I look between the chloride and the bromide ion, which one is going to have a larger size? Bromide. So your bromide ion is larger. So that affects your denominator, not largest or larger. So it has the weaker bond. So two things to look at if you're given ionic compounds and then you're asked to compare which one's gonna have the stronger bond versus the weaker bond. You'll need to look at the differences in their charge. And then if that's not an option, then you would look at the differences in their size. So ionic compounds exist as a crystal lattice and they're alternating negative and positive. And once again, even if you were given this without these, you should be able to tell the cation would be your smaller one and the anion would be your larger one. And because it's a crystal lattice, uh, 
ionic compounds are not like metals. They're not ductile, no, they're not malleable. They're actually brittle because if you try to bend them or they get broken, then it disrupts that crystal lattice structure and then they're going to brittle and usually fall apart. And then this is a pretty good little box. We already talked about all of those things, but it just kind of talks about them again in a reinforcing manner. So just kind of look over that whenever you're studying for the test at a later point in time. All right, so let's go to our covalent bonding because we are working up to fine molecular structure. So most compounds are covalently bonded, especially carbon compounds. So if you remember, that's gonna be all of your organic compounds. Um, so we have a couple, or, or we have uh, one theory that we talk about the bonding of those. It's called the localized electron bonding model. And it assumes that a molecule is composed of atoms that are bound together by the sharing of electrons using the atomic orbitals. So that's gonna be the valence electrons. There's other electron pairs that are assumed to be localized on just a particular atom. And that's the lone pair like we did yesterday or in the space between the atoms if it's a bonding pair. So we have a couple, couple of different things going. Lone pairs of electrons that one element keeps and then bonding pairs that they share. And both of them are going to affect the shape of the molecule because negatives repel. So they're trying to get a long, far as part as possible. If you remember, that's what Vesper was all about. But we're going to find that these lone pairs actually are going to affect the shape a little bit more than the bonding. All right, so Lewis, destru Lewis structures describe the valence electron arrangement. We did that yesterday. The geometry of the mo molecule is predicted by Vesper. And the description of the type of atomic orbitals are blended by the atoms where the electrons are shared. And that's something we really did not cover. That's hybridized orbitals. So that'll be like a, another little step that we'll add uh, as we start using that chart. So I don't know that we're gonna get to it today. In fact, I don't think we're gonna get to it today, but uh, the quiz probably won't take very long tomorrow. And then we'll start using that other little chart I gave y'all. Thank you. Yes, that George. So if you look, I think on the last, does it say something that, about hybrid? Yes, hybridization. So that's talking about how the electrons come together um, and how they're shared. And then the orbitals, they kind of hybridize or form a change up a little bit to be at a little bit different energy level. All right, so the number of bond pairs, once again, that's going to be your octet rule. You can predict the number of bonds by counting the number of unpaired electrons in the Lewis structure. That's what we did yesterday. You know, for instance, carbon, that's kind of why it's almost in a class by itself. It has those four lone pair of electrons, so it tends to form four bonds, all singles, doubles, a triple, but anyway, it's gonna form four bonds. Um, the dash is used to represent the pair of shared electrons, and then the dots are used to represent a lone pair. And we did that yesterday whenever we kind of started doing our Lewis dot. Um, our single bonds are just one pair of shared electrons, and that is called a sigma bond. Multiple bonds are most often formed by carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. CNOPs, if you like a little mnemonic. So if I have a double bond now, I have two pairs of shared electrons. So that's one sigma and one pi bond. So that sigma bond is going to be in every one. It's the strongest type of bond. And then for the double and for the triple, you're just adding on a pi bond and those are a little bit weaker. 
and it's because of the way that they orient themselves that makes them a little bit weaker. So if I have a triple bond, I'm gonna have three pairs of electrons. So that's going to be still that one sigma and now two pi bonds. So um, obviously combinations of the sigma and the pi are stronger. And we talked about that earlier, that a double bond is gonna be stronger than a single bond and a triple bond would be the strongest because there's more electrons shared. So it's pulled closer together. The atoms are pulled closer together but the sigma bond itself is the strongest type. And remember that's present in all three of those. I think that's just kind of what that last little paragraph says, a little bit longer way. All right, any questions on that? Okay. Uh, octet rule we went over yesterday. And I did just want to touch on something kind of kind of mentioned this yesterday, but I really didn't draw it out where we said sometimes, not often, you'll have this odd electron compound where you're going to have a compound that has just a single electron, because we know that electrons usually exist in pairs. And so if we just look at the Lewis dot of nitrogen monoxide, I have five electrons from the nitrogen and six from the oxygen. So I have a total of 11. So that's an odd number. That makes it a little bit different. So whenever they come together, I have nitrogen with a double bond to the oxygen. And then oxygen has two lone pair. Very seldom does it not have those two lone pair. Then my nitrogen has its one lone pair, but then the odd thing is it also has this single electron existing by itself. So that's kind of what they were talking about here where you have an odd number of valence electrons and then they don't end up obeying the octet rule. And we would find the same thing if we drew, drew all those out. All right, any questions on that? All right. So we did the Lewis dot yesterday and does it, did anybody go home and do any practice or more importantly, have any questions or, on any of them? Pretty easy. Um, seemed like there was something I wanted to, hold on one second. That's that can't remember exactly what I We talk, I don't know if y'all remember resonance from Kim one, but I want to talk about that for just a minute. I can find a good example of it. Never mind. I thought it was going. Cool. Yeah, it is. Let's see. I was going to say, I think it may. I think it was tomorrow. Never mind, it's not going to take bubbles tomorrow. So just wait until we're going to do a seat. All righty. So we'll skip on past that. And we're going to do this little bit. And then you'll have a little time to work on practice if you need to, because we're not going to jump into Vesper yet. So there's something that's called a coordinate covalent bond, and those are atoms like nitrogen and phosphorus. And sometimes they will share a lone pair of electrons with another atom that is short of electrons. And we call those are called coordinate covalent bonds. So a coordinate covalent bonds is when electrons, that's supposed to be an E, in the bond are from one element. So usually if I have a bond, one electron comes from one element and one electron comes from another element, but these are a little bit different. And based off a coordinate covalent bond that fulfills the Lewis acid base definition. And we'll do acids and bases later on, but I don't know if you remember from Kim one, there were several different definitions and this was one that was fulfilled by talking about the Lewis acid base. So if we look at these two compounds, so boron trihydride 
that would be my boron with three hydrogens attached. And remember, boron can have six valence electrons and be stable. So if I think about this because it only has six valence electrons, it can be thought of as being short of electrons. And I put that in quotations because I mean, it's not like unstable, it's still a stable compound. But if we go off what we're used to usually seeing. And then if I have uh, ammonia, which is in H3, It has that lone pair that's just sitting up there and it's ready to join something that needs a few electrons. So those two will come together and we'll have a bond in the middle, obviously, of shared electrons. So that particular bond is where you have your coordinate covalent. Because that bond right there, I drew it with dots. I could have just drawn it with a line. That bond there that's holding those two molecules together are, is actually made of electrons that only came from the nitrogen. And so this is called, when they come together, they name it a little bit different. This is called a Lewis acid base complex. So the BH3 would be the Lewis acid because by definition, that is an electron donor. I was supposed to say donor. And then my ammonia, by this definition, is a Lewis base. Because as I guess you can probably see, that would be the electron acceptor. Oh, I did this wrong. I'm sorry, y'all. It doesn't make sense, does it? That one has to accept and this one has to donate. And it, I don't know, it, whenever we did acids and bases in Chem 1, and we, the Lewis, is, the Lewis definition of acids and bases isn't used a lot. We talked about either being a proton acceptor or a proton donor, because that's a little bit more typical and a little bit more common, but this does fulfill one or the other. All right, anybody got any questions on that? Fun stuff. All right. So we'll talk a little bit about polarity. So polar bonds and polar molecules. Um, I've mentioned a couple of times that something can have polar bonds within the molecule, but not be a polar molecule. And it all has to do with symmetry and whether they can cancel each other out. It's kind of like a vector in physics where they have a, a strength and then also a direction so they can cancel each other out. It's the same thing here if we're talking about a overall whether a molecule is polar or nonpolar. So in order for a, a substance to be polar, bonds within the molecule must carry different charges. So you're gonna have a dipole moment, not a temporary dipole moment, a permanent dipole moment. And the dipoles that are present must not cancel each other out due to symmetry. So we've done this several times. A dipole moment is going to be indicated with an arrow that points to where the electrons shift. So water, we've done that, and it's already drawn out here. But once again, whether a bond, bond is polar has to do to electronegativity differences, and oxygen is much more polar than hydrogen. So that's why the arrow is drawn that way, because the electrons are shifting. And then you see the little positive sign because 
that's supposed to signify that the hydrogen has a partial positive charge. So in this case, the bonds are polar and they are both in the same direction. So it's like they're additive. They can't cancel each other out. So this would have polar bonds and it's a polar molecule. Has both of them. Same thing with my NH3, nitrogen is more electronegative. So the electrons shift here. All of those are going in the same way. So it'd be like a vector that was going in the same way you add them all up together. And then on top of that, even to make it more negative, there's that lone pair. So all of those are being added together. So I have polar bonds and then I have also overall no symmetry for it to cancel out. So this would also have polar bonds and be a polar molecule. Have y'all covered vectors in physics yet? No. No, not yet. Okay. Maybe I'll be a little bit ahead of the game. All right. So let's look at a couple of things that are not considered a polar or a molecule. So CH3. CH4, thank you. If I look at CH4, these bonds are considered nonpolar and they're right on the edge. Oh, at the very beginning, we talked about electronegativity differences and by some, this is a 0.35 difference, by others, it's a 0.4 difference. But anyway, that difference is usually considered not to be polar. And then there's also symmetry. So they cancel each other out. So this is nonpolar bonds and non symmetry or non symmetrical. Which means the molecule is nonpolar. Now my next one, carbon tetrachloride. So I have carbon with three chlorines. So do you think that bond is polar? Is chlorine pretty, pretty uh, electronegative? Yeah. So this would be a polar bond Most anything with like fluorine, chlorine is going to be a polar bond, except diatomic, that wouldn't be. So that's a polar bond, but this is a non-polar molecule, exactly. Because if you think about it, they cancel each other out. The electrons are shifting this way and that way. So you can think an equal amount of shift, opposite directions, they cancel each other out. Same thing here. The electrons are shifting to the chlorine but opposite direction, so they cancel each other out. So this is a symmetrical molecule, and that's why the overall molecule is not polar. So does anybody remember if I have a non-polar molecule, what kind of IMF it would have? London dispersion forces, yeah, London dispersion. Because remember, you have to either have hydrogen bonding, which obviously we can't have with that, or I have to have a permanent dipole, which is, would have to be a pole, some type of polar molecule. And um, I don't, oh yeah, that, on that paper that y'all got yesterday, it does ask, I think you also will have a chance to work on polarity, doesn't it, at the very bottom. And this is what I put the, uh, the video of in, in case you want to look over that. Not going to be on the quiz tomorrow, but at some times, if you want to take a little bit, a little bit of time to look over it. All right, and then this just kind of goes over what I've already talked about, and then we can look at a couple of other molecules. So why don't you draw CO two? So the first one thing that you need to do if you're deciding something's polar or nonpolar is you're going to need to draw the Lewis dot. 
stocks. So draw the Lewis stock for carbon dioxide. So we only have 16 electrons to work with. So that's going to make you have a couple of double bonds there between the carbons and oxygen. So hopefully you got that. I doubt up my counting there. All right. So my qu first question is, do you think these bonds are polar? They are, they are considered polar, not nearly as as much as if it would have been like with the halogen. But in some of these, when they get that close, it's a little bit hard to tell. And so um, if you're given the electronegativity differences, then it's a lot easier. But most bonds are polar. You're not gonna come across a whole lot that are non-polar. Carbon, hydrogen are probably the most, and, di and your diatomic. So those are gonna be your most common non-polar ones. So the bonds are polar. Oh, <laughs> yep. Did I do that on my notes? No, I did not do that on my notes. I just draw the wrong, I drew the wrong number of electrons on my notes. All right. So there we go. That makes looks better. So, but do you think that this is a polar molecule? No, because it's symmetry, right? Both of them are pulling the electrons away. And so they're going to cancel each other out. The other one is a little bit trickier to see, BF3. And I think we've already drawn that, I feel like, a couple of times. And whenever I'm just doing these in notes, you notice, I'm, well, I can put them in there sometimes. I get lazy and I put all the electrons if we're mainly just concerned about the bonds. So boron and fluoride, this would definitely be a polar bond because fluoride is going to be a four and boron is a little bit closer. Do you think that it would be a polar molecule? It is not a polar molecule. This is considered a nonpolar molecule because this is considered symmetry. They're all, and, and sometimes like, for me, I'm going to tell y'all, for me, this is, it's very easy for me to see that symmetrical or that symmetrical. This to me is a little bit harder to see, but this would also be considered symmetrical and those vectors would cancel out. And sometimes it's a little bit harder to see because you just draw because of the way that we draw it. But this would be considered nonpolar because that is considered to be a symmetrical molecule and they cancel each other out. All right. Any questions over that? Mm -hmm. That this one right here. Oh, vice methane. Yes, that is symmetrical. It is also nonpolar bonds. So remember, for it to be a polar molecule, it first of all, it has to have polar bonds, and that one does it. So it's already, even if it wasn't symmetrical, it wouldn't meet the criteria. But yeah. So everything that we drew on this page, these would all be considered nonpolar molecules. Some of them might have polar bonds. And like I said, um, this is, a, for me, this is one of the things I struggle with a little bit on some of them. Um, like I said, especially a little bit like this, 
And I did put a couple of videos in there that if you have time over the weekend, might be a little bit helpful on those. Okay, we're going to stop here because then it goes to Vesper and molecular geometry. And I think we can get started a little bit on that tomorrow. But that'll give you a little bit of time if you have questions or if you want to look over any of your practice in preparation for hopefully what will be an easy quiz for us to start our six weeks off. Y'all got this six weeks and next six weeks really to worry about grades. By the time we get to our third six week, everybody probably ought to leave here with 100 on our third six weeks. We take the test early on and then we do some little projects, probably do some labs just for y'all to have a chance to do the lab without the write-ups, you know, just in case you, you do end up taking chemistry in college, you will have seen them. So everybody usually ends my last six weeks with a hundred. I used to rearrange that and kind of like whatever your fifth six weeks was, I saved that for the six, six weeks, because like my, the seniors, they're going to do your GPA with the fifth, six weeks. But then I kind of got trouble for doing that. So. Because people that weren't taking AP chemistry, they felt like that people were getting it unfair. Can't do that anymore. Sorry, sorry, seniors, if that's a big deal for y'all. I know, I knew it was a big deal. I had to barricade off my lab. That's the first time I've had to do that. My biology, I've got biology sophomores, a lot of very immature guys. No matter how many times I say stay out of there. So yesterday I found that water, you know, that somebody ripped that rubber hose off of that sink. See how it's on that other sink? Are y'all leaving today, Michael? Oh, do you have your Oh, you're, there's only one spot for it. It's not that many play, people play it. Sorry, I just remember I'm recording for Joseph doesn't want to hear all of my comments.